When you think of the Middle Ages, what are the first things that come to mind? Mawoja, barbaric, primitive, stagnant, and the like. The Middle Ages are frequently depicted as a time marked by utter darkness, characterized by widespread ignorance, superstitions, and violence, with little to no innovation or progress. Likewise, individuals from this era are often depicted as uncivilized, barbaric, and bereft of intellectual and cultural accomplishments. This notion of history was there a strong blow by Ian Mortimer in his book Medieval Horizons. Why the Middle Ages Matter. Importantly, by challenging the lens with which we used to see the world, a largely technological one. The focus on technological advancements and inventions as the primary catalyst for social transformation often causes us to neglect other significant changes that occurred in the Middle Ages, including things like urbanization and the evolution of women's and workers' rights. In other words, technological innovation is a wrong tool to assess changes in the Middle Ages. In this essay, I will cover some of the poignant points Ian raised to challenge this notion using this metaphorical horizon framework which allows us to appreciate the profound changes in this era. Two important caveats before we proceed. There is a focus on medieval England in the materials presented, and the date range of the period presented is from the 11th century to the 16th century. Chapter 1 Guns, Canons, and the Parliament In the early Middle Ages, and it goes without saying, that violence was pervasive, with warfare raids and feuds being common occurrences. In the 11th century, chronicler vividly depicted the horrors of the First Crusade in Jerusalem. Crusaders engaged in a ruthless massacre, slaughtering Sassarans and Gentiles indiscriminately. They brutally murdered women and children, leaving pies of severed heads, hands, and feet in the streets. These grim accounts underscored the prevalence of the extreme violence during this period. But things were not stagnant in this respect in the Middle Ages. A series of developments led to the altered attitudes towards violence and war in this period. For one, we have the influence of a church, several regulations of warfare, evolution of paper authority, economic factors, and an emergence of humanist thoughts. Let's start with the church. The church took a stand to alter the prevailing attitudes towards violence and feudal warfare through the introduction of initiatives such as the peace of God and the truce of God. These efforts were aimed at reducing violence by offering protection to non-combatants and setting aside specific times for peace, including religious holidays and certain weekdays. Also, the increasing influence of the papacy in this period, which allowed them to push such initiatives such as the peace of God, as stated earlier, meant that secular rulers needed papal approval for wars, which led to more careful consideration and justification of military actions. While we had these changes to reduce warfare, it was these periods that also saw the so-called holy wars, and such contradictions can be explained by the papacy's role in the medieval society. On the one hand, we have spiritual leadership, on the other hand, we have political ambition. But I digress. We also saw economic considerations significantly impacting attitudes towards warfare during the Middle Ages, shaping the strategic decisions of the era in profound ways. The rise of monetary economies, alongside the growing complexity of military engagement, introduced financial limitations that constrained the capacities of monarchs to initiate and sustain prolonged warfare. The maintenance of armies and the executions of external military campaigns demanded substantial economic resources, often more than what was readily available. These economic strain forced leaders to rethink the feasibility and the implications of war. In regions like England, the advent of parliamentary authority marked a pivotal shift in the governance of military affairs. Parliament held some power to sanction or deny royal proposal concerning taxations and military ventures. Consequently, monarchs were compelled to seek parliamentary backing prior to launching expensive wars. 
This shift somewhat democratized the decision-making process regarding war as the financial oversight by parliament effectively gave the populace a voice in matters of war and peace. Moreover, the latter Middle Ages witnessed an expansion in trade and commerce with a begin emphasis on economic prosperity and stability. The merchant class, whose interests lay in the uninterrupted flow of trade and the assurance of political stability, naturally favored conditions of peace. Warfare, with its capacity to disrupt trade routes and endanger profits, became increasingly undesirable to those vested in the economic sector. Historical instances underscore some of these dynamics I've earlier stated. In England, the acknowledgement of King Edward I in 1297 that the prerogative to declare war rested with Parliament, and King Edward III's admission in 1339 that any truce with France needed parliamentary ratification, exemplified the growing legislative control of our war. Furthermore, technological advancement significantly altered the conduct and perception of warfare during the later Middle Ages. The construction of castles, along with the development of cannons and long bows, marked a departure from the era of individual combat, steering warfare towards a more impersonal and strategic domain. This evolution diminished the chivalric ethos, which had celebrated individual value and knighty virtues and placed the renewed emphasis on military strategy. Battles became less about personal honor and more about the tactical use of technology and fortifications. Parallel to this technological rise, the rise of humanist ideas began to challenge the prevailing attitudes towards violence and warfare. The humanists' emphasis on the dignity and the worth of the individual contributed to the gradual shift away from the celebration of martial prowess towards a preference for diplomatic and peaceful resolutions to disputes. Indeed, one could argue that the seed of modern attitudes towards war was laid into the ground by medieval thinkers like Desiderius Erasmus and Thomas More. Here is Thomas More in his 1516 book Utopia, talking about an imaginary new world saying that they detest war as a very brutal thing and which, to the reproach of human nature, is more practiced by men than by any sort of beasts. They, in opposition to the sentiments of almost all other nations, think that there is nothing more inglorious than that glory that is gained by war. And therefore, though they accustom themselves daily to military exercises and the discipline of war, yet they do not rashly engage in war unless it be either to defend themselves or their friends from any unjust aggressors, or to assist an oppressed nation in shaking off the yoke of tyranny. Chapter 2 Medieval Mobility Unleashed The Middle Ages is brutal in so many ways, which is evident in the wild inequality of the system. In the 11th century, the landscape of land ownership was markedly different from what it would become by the 16th century. For example, initially, a mere fraction of the population, that's less than 2% had land, indicating a concentration of land in the hands of a small elite. This contrasted sharply with the 16th century, where land ownership had become more widespread, with an estimated 25% of the population holding some form of land. Again, this is anything but stagnant. This evolution from concentrated to more dispersed land ownership unfolded against the backdrop of the feudal system. Initially, the king was a primary landowner, distributing land to lords and nobles in return for military service and loyalty. These lords, in turn, divided their lands among knights and vassals, establishing a rigid hierarchical structure that defined the era. Concurrently, the manorial system prevailed with the vast majority of the population working as serfs on these estates, devoid of any legal rights to the land they toiled upon. As a side note, I think I should make a distinction between the feudal system and the manorial system. 
The feudal system can be seen as the overarching political and the military framework of medieval society, while the manorial system operated within this room as the economic and social organization of rural life. Together, they formed the backbone of medieval European society, influencing every aspect of life from governance to daily work. Now, back to our story. The 11th century was also characterized by limited land mobility. Land was not only scarce, but also tightly bound to traditional structures, making it difficult for ordinary people to acquire. This scarcity and lack of mobility severely constrained social and economic advancement for the majority. However, by the 16th century, significant shifts had taken place. The decline of feudalism and the emergence of free old land ownership democratized land houses, allowing a broader segment of society to own and manage land. Which begs the question, what was responsible for the shift that had resulted in such changes? The Black Death. A catastrophic bubonic plague pandemic swept through Europe between 1346 and 1353, standing as one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. This pandemic led to the demise of approximately 25 million individuals, nearly one third of Europe's population at a time. The silver lining? The Black Death profoundly reshaped the medieval economy and societal structures primarily through its dramatic reduction of the population. The massive loss of life led to a significant labor shortage, which, in turn, enhanced the negotiation power of peasants. As a result, wages rose and working conditions improved, marking a notable shift in the labor market dynamics. The scarcity of labor also eroded the foundations of the feudal system, which had heavily relied on serfdom. Lots found themselves increasingly dependent on paid labor, accelerating the transition towards free labor and contributing to the decline of serfdom. In the same vein, this period also saw the acceleration of urbanization as people migrated from rural areas into cities. The consolidation of farmland and resources in the urban areas, coupled with the increased agricultural productivity, further fueled the growth and development of cities. Furthermore, the pandemic opened up avenues for social mobility, not previously available. With vast swaths of the population gone, those from lower social echelons stepped into roles and occupations left vacant, leading to the formation of new social classes. This era saw the rise of wealthy merchants and skilled artisans contributing to a more diverse and stratified society. To really come to grabs of what happened then, Edward III, the King of England, from 1327 to 1377, was so much perturbed by the social changes that he enacted sumptuary laws, restricting the attire and the dietary choices of the different social classes. Just imagine that. Additionally, he passed the 1351 Statue of Laborers, aiming to curb peasants from departing their manners in search of better pay. Despite these efforts, the momentum for change was unstoppable. So much for no progress. Things were simply not stagnant in this area. For one, as explained in the first chapter of this essay, the concept of war as an activity that could be regulated and subject to legal limitations emerged in the Middle Ages. And indeed, there were progress on many fronts. A peasant teleported from the 11th century to the 16th century will simply be shocked by the massive reduction in inequality. And talking about progress, in a world where we expect an iPhone from our predecessors, we quickly forget that the seeds for such technological marvels were sown centuries ago during the Middle Ages. Innovations such as the Arabic numerals, optical lenses, mechanical clocks, and the foundation of practices of scientific inquiry laid the groundwork for the advanced engineering and computing sciences that drive today's digital revolution. We ought to often recall that Isaac Newton wrote in his 1675 letter to Robert Hooks, If I have seen further, it is by standing 
on the shoulders of giants. <laughs>